Hey, Miles, how's it going? It's going well, Amy. Are you ready to get us all started? Yeah, do uh, we have folks on the line? And we do. Okay. And you yeah. have, have you let us know how this all works? <laughs> Here, between panelists and attendees, we have 64 people right now. That's so exciting. Um, yesterday, that's actually more than that, because a lot of times there's more than one person watching on each, on each uh, device. So it's really exciting. Yeah. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, as you can see, we are learning uh, on the fly how to use this new platform uh, Zoom. Um, one of the difficulties with Zoom is that each participant has the ability to control their own screen settings. And so I can't simply deliver just one setting uh, for, for everybody to, to see the same thing. So one way to, to help with that uh, so that you can see both the video and the bulletin at the same time um, is to uh, split the screen so that you're able to equally on both sides see the same size of uh, display for the, the video portion and for the bulletin portion. So right now you'll see that I'm sharing the bulletin as the majority of your screens. If you're seeing this on a, a desktop or a laptop computer, you'll have the opportunity and the option um, to hover over the video that's right right now playing you'll see reverend amy looking uh just uh you know ready to go um if you hover over amy's video to the slight left of the video you'll see an icon with two vertical white lines if you move your mouse over that and then hover over that and click down and hold your click you can drag that line to the left so that you'll have more space for the video you'll see that the video will get bigger as you drag it to the left when you do that, you can uh, decide what, whatever portion of the screen you'd like to display with video versus the bulletin um, and sort of set it up for whatever size is right for you. Uh, if you're doing this on a phone, there may be a similar way to do it, but I, I don't know. I don't have uh, everybody's phone is different and, and both the, uh, the Apple and Android apps are different as well for Zoom. So I'm not exactly sure how it would work to do, do that shift on a phone, but um, I, I would imagine that the functionality is relatively similar. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna turn it over to Reverend Amy and Izzy, who is looking very morning prayer indeed. Mm -hmm. It's okay, I want the family to come say hi, because um, Jacob's gonna go out probably before coffee hour and help Auntie Robin lead her 10 o'clock service from the studio here where we live. So here, here we all are in our living room. And then get in there. Um, Izzy was pretty happy that she could bring Blanky to church this morning. So, all right guys, so we'll get started. Thank you. Please come. Watch the cord, watch the cord. There we go. Okay. So good morning once again, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful that we're able to be together in spirit, um, worshiping uh, virtually, but also actually, uh, actually worshiping all of us together um, from wherever we are here on this, this platform. And I wanna give huge thanks to Miles uh, for all of his work. We've run through this a lot of times and getting all the kids worked out for Joanna, who even now I know is helping people get online here. Uh, Michelle, David, all of our staff and uh, for Fred for zooming in virtually and Jennifer to read. Um, and I want to thank our intercessors who right now are praying for us, praying for technology to, to come through so that we can all worship together in spirit and in truth. We um, this morning will be worshiping using morning prayer. Um, and so what that means essentially is we have all the same parts that we're used to in the liturgy of the word, the first half of the service, but um, they're in a little bit different order. So uh, morning prayer is a, a great part of our tradition. If you were part of the Episcopal Church or attended an Episcopal Church before 1979, you'll remember that morning prayer was the normal service. They would have a Eucharist maybe once a month um, or at the early service, but morning prayer was the principal service of the church for many, many, many years. 
um, morning prayer is a part of the daily office. And um, if you got a chance to look at your e-news yesterday morning, we put in a wonderful uh, article by Dr. Susan Hawkins about uh, the daily office and where that comes from. It's a great tradition of praying the hours, um, praying morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, Compline, which is prayers before bed. And it's a, it's a deep part of our Anglican Episcopal heritage in a way that we can enter into the greater prayer of the church. The idea is somewhere, someone is always offering these prayers. And so the prayers of the church um, go around the globe, around the clock, um, always offering our prayers to God. So we, we join in that great tradition this morning and I invite you to follow along in your bulletin. Um, you may, you may uh, exercise your Episcopal calisthenics and stand and kneel if you wish. Stand, kneel, sit, all those things. Um, but you're also welcome to maintain uh, whatever degree of comfort you have right now in your home. So we'll begin on, on the first page of our bulletin. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others, those things that are necessary for our life and salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us be in silence and with penitence and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may, may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now we'll go to David for the Venite and the Psalm. Okay, good morning. First we say together, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. So we're going to chant the Venite this morning. I will chant the first verse. It's a simple hymn chant tune. So I'll chant the first verse and then start over. And you can either join me in chanting or speak it if you prefer. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for the joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all nations, above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. 
Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. And again we say together, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. All right, now we're going to sing this well-known psalm together. Again, I will chant the first verse and then start over from the beginning. And you may chant or speak as you prefer. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And now we go to Jennifer King for the readings. A reading from the Ephesians. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I give it over to Richard and to David, who will lead us in Psalm 23, shepherd me, O God. Thank you. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who called Jesus, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they again asked the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, is this your son, who they say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, 
He is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins. And are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, we are so excited to um, introduce Dr. Fred Luskin. Uh, Stanford University Professor of Psychology, founder of the Forgiveness Institute, and a great friend of Grace of the School Church. Over to you, Fred. So excited to hear from you. Well, hi, everybody. Um, sorry not to be there in person. Um, it's a, it's a, weird, a weird time to be, um, you know, joining like this. And... I mean, everybody's aware of it, and, and you you can feel the the uncertainty and the the loss and and the the apprehension, um, you know, anywhere. And um, you know, it's for for most of us who like you who live, many of you in St. Helena or in the Valley, and you know, me who lives or works at Stanford. This is an uncomfortable, um, like joining of planet Earth. You know, we're, we're getting a taste of the uncertainty and um, lack of solidity that has been most people's experience on this planet. You know, the I remember reading once that um, somewhere in the like 1850s, I think that only about 15% of people on planet Earth had food certainty. That is that they, they knew for sure where their next meal was coming from. And that that's, you know, incomprehensible to, to, to the people in my world that 
not not only don't we know where our next meal is coming from, but you know we have Whole Foods and Safeway and you know restaurants and um, everything right at the tip of our fingers, and 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 now we're being you know we're touching the the apprehension of 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 humanity with some of our restrictions and the fears of will i have enough and you know can i squirrel enough food away in my basement so that if hell freezes over like i can at least eat for a while and um you know we're, we're all touching the the more elemental um dangers that almost everybody has experienced except the wealthy and the privileged um, throughout history and and it, it's 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 hard to do i mean you just have to admit that this is hard that um we're not used to it um, we probably all have resistance to being um, humbled and and diminished um and it's scary you know it's 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 scary to to not have the protections that we're used to having for everybody you know the protections of wealth the protections of certain um, governmental privileges and it's just it, it just makes everybody more apprehensive and the the hard part that i see for for us all is like both individually and collectively, what do we do about it? You know, what the, 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 the challenge, I mean, and, and we all struggle with the same thing. So, you know, I, I have a friend of mine yesterday who showed me a picture of one of his brother's homes where, where he is literally preparing for Armageddon you know, that he has this big extra refrigerator in his house filled with supplies and an entire room filled with supplies so that he'll be okay, um, give or take, at least food-wise for a year. And, um, you know, both my friend and I, and I knew that at the same time that made some degree of sense, there was something missing there you know some some concern for others and 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 it just seems as as what one of the things that this experience will do and none of us know how long or how difficult will be is it will give us a gut check as to our you know relative i'm going to say spiritual touch you know is it is it all about us? Is it all about protecting who we care for? Or does it reveal to us that we we have developed compassion and that we do have concern for others? I mean, that, that will be revealed. Um, the, the question of how much fear do we let dominate us will be revealed to us. I mean, you, you have to have fear. I mean, if, if, if you don't have fear, like you're basically, you know, you're not paying attention or, or you're six feet under already. Um, you know, fear is the innate human response to change and threat and danger. And it's, it's not just humans, it's every species on the planet. It's, basic wiring is fear and 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 so you you can't escape that but the question is besides fear like what else and and what else do we cultivate to exist alongside fear you know and that's to me that's I'm going to say that's the question. That's one of the questions that Jesus is always asking of people. Like besides your fear, 
And besides your concern for yourself, what else do you offer? And, and what other qualities do you bring? And what other qualities do you cultivate? And those are very challenging questions. You know, the, the, the world wouldn't be in the condition that it's in if fear wasn't so powerful and if um, it wasn't so deeply wired into our nervous systems and if we didn't have the capacity to engender and practice other qualities as well. Like the, you, have, you have a basic container of fear and then you have the human aspect that can operate around it that can not eliminate the fear but can give fear a different kind of purpose besides just survival and protection and and it'll just be interesting for everybody to see how it is that we all move ahead in whatever way we're being asked to move ahead which is what else will we cultivate in addition to fear and protection you know there's there's that wonderful um training in a course in miracles and and the course in miracles is you know based on the question of like do you want to see through the eyes of fear or do you want to see through the eyes of love and 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 those are very very difficult questions because as human beings you have to see through the eyes of fear it's just what is it what else and and how do we language it to ourselves like how do we deal with our perceptions so that we mitigate the fear and we take care of the basic requirements that fear asks and then at some level allow ourselves to a bit ascend like Maslow's hierarchy of needs you know and and the hierarchy of needs are yeah survival is first safety is second and then people and then esteem and then giving and then meaning and then transcendence and and those needs don't go away they can just be buried sometimes by the survival and safety needs you know they can be obscured and and i think one of the the reasons that we all come together still in in churches like this and which are happening all over is to remind ourselves that safety and survival are not the end and that those are the most basic needs but they're not the only needs and that there are again you know not just relationship needs right after safety is the need for community but it's not just a need for community it's a need to contribute to a community it's the the safety needs can have you take from a community like can can have you make sure that you get yours and that you you have what you need those are those are safety needs but the relationship needs are what can you give? Like, what can you offer? Like, what kind of support or solace or generosity do you have? And then, then from those relationship needs come the esteem needs and the, you know, the, the higher level of like, here's, here's my gift or here's my giving or here's my purpose. And, and those needs do not stop. You know, I, what, one thing I was reminded of, and, and it's, it was just inside of me, um, as, as I saw, like, you know, I signed on like 45 minutes ago before, and I saw everybody like getting started for this and, 
you know, were practicing and making sure the web thing worked. And, you know, I was thinking um, how, like how fascinating that is that in, in 2020, we have these little machines in front of us that allow us somehow to communicate with each other in, you know, a, a pretty amazing way. And, and here we are getting together in, in a, a religious kind of way to, um, you know, to join, not just as, as people, but to allow, I'm going to say, the part of us that's a soul to also connect. But I was struck also by my, my knowledge of what the Jewish people, some of the Jewish people did in the Holocaust which is even people in um, the concentration camps would try to meet together to pray. And, and even people in the concentration camps would, um, if they could, share tiny, tiny little pieces of the Torah with each other, like they might they might write something on a, a scrap of toilet paper and, and share it. You know, my God is whatever. That no matter how awful an experience was, it didn't extinguish, it couldn't extinguish some, some tiny piece of, of the human experience that even in the absolute worst that anybody could imagine, you know, some people were connected and trying to connect each other in this way of like, even though on the external, it looks bad, there's a little piece of the internal that remains free. And, and, and that, like that image to me has has always been striking to me. And and the last piece that that I'll I'll talk about, not to like take too much of of your time. I've been doing a good number of talks in the last two weeks on um, both the distinction and the need for both physical safety and psychological safety and and most of the directions certainly the ones that we get from the cdc or places like that are about physical safety you know make sure that you keep six feet between you and you know don't cough on anybody and um, protect yourself and your family those are all physical safety measures like they're they're designed to, at best, spread virus, you know, contact, contradict the spread of virus. But those warnings decrease psychological safety. Like when you're, when you're always focused on physical threat, your psychological safety goes down and your inner safety decreases. So what's missing in those admonitions is one an understanding of how threat itself reduces immune function and makes us less resistant to disease but two it, it requires in us some balancing some psychological safety that can exist alongside the physical safety so the physical safety is again, you know, externally generated and required for the culture to flourish. But if there's too much fear, then even physical safety becomes compromised because people locked in fear, they don't see things clearly, is all they see is threat. And so I've been giving a good number of talks I mean, in, in places that I've talked to anyway, on, on the need to cultivate psychological safety as well. 
And, and there's a couple simple things about that. One of them is the, the difficult understanding that on planet Earth, you're never 100% physically safe. Like that, that is a, a difficult truth of being a human being, which is if you're lucky at times, you get to 99% safe, but you never get to 100 so you have to have inner mechanisms to quiet down and to touch some place of equanimity that is independent from the physical safety. That's one. And two is, again, the very simple reminders of compassion and gratitude that instead of just a fear response, you also want a compassion response. One, a compassion response for yourself and your family, which is we're in a tough predicament. You know, an honest, like gentle compassion, but not just fear based. And two, everybody's in this same tough predicament, not just me a compassion, a, a, a little more kind-hearted lens to hold our experience. And the gratitude piece is very similar in the sense that within the fear of hoarding and excluding everybody else from like our circle of care, which is what fear does, like just to, you know, for all of us, just to remind ourselves when we do go to Costco, that, that, that there's still abundance. And when they, we still have a home to be like kind of isolated, you know, whatever it is that compassion and gratitude do. From, from what I've seen, the, the, the inner like safety becomes almost as important as the outer safety. So let me let me just finish my minutes with a, a moment of meditation practice. Um, just a, a cultivating equanimity moment. And so all of you who are listening out there, if you'd please just take a minute and allow your eyes to close. And, and as you allow your eyes to close, get comfortable. Like it's, a, it's really an important aspect is to be able to sit comfortably. And to do that, you will, you will need to notice if parts of you are tense or, or tight and do what you can to relax them. And also to, in particular, relax your abdomen so that you can breathe comfortably. And allow your belly particularly to relax. And when you inhale, allow your abdomen to expand because that's the only way that your nervous system knows that you're relaxed is when you're no longer holding your belly tight. That's when your brain and nervous system relax, recognize that you're okay.
And then we're going to do like a minute or so of one of Thich Nhat Hanh's meditations. And this can only be done with a relaxed abdomen is when you inhale and your belly opens, just say to yourself, I am. And then when you exhale, say to yourself, at peace. So this is done with full breathing. You inhale, your abdomen's relaxed. It expands when you inhale and you are saying to yourself, I am. And then you exhale and you contract your belly at peace. And then practice maybe 10 breaths worth of I am at peace. And then after those 10 breaths or so, just very gently allow your eyes to open. And, and for just a moment, see if you can sit without distraction, like just sit. And again, um, just just the reminder that, like for human beings, we need like a sense of inner safety, as as well as we need the outer protection. Anyway, thank you. It was nice to virtually see you all again. Thank you so much, Fred. It was just incredible to hear your words um, this morning. I just, I'll, I'll probably listen to it again and try to share it far and wide because it's, your perspective is always uh, so important, but um, this morning it just really hit it all even more than ever. Getting our bulletin back online and we'll continue with the Apostles' Creed. A little bit different from the Nicene Creed that we normally say on Sunday. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. So we pray the Lord's Prayer. Um, oftentimes at our 10 o'clock service, we pray it um, holding hands. Lucas, do you want to hold my hand for this? Baby, you want to come hold my hand? It's all right. Um, so I invite you to hold hands with, ever, with whoever you're not socially distancing from and, um, and reach out your, your heart. And we can hold hearts with all of our uh, Grace Church family and those we love near and far. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. So we continue on the next page. I invite you to respond uh, to the suffrages, the part that's bolded. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God Almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we might not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I'll ask Jennifer to lead us in the prayers of the people. Mm -hmm. Let us pray in the light and hope of Christ, who unites each of us and all creation as we offer our prayer, prayers for the church and the world and all those in need saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, please keep our families, our children and all the peoples in the world under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up those who are brought low, deeply knowing that nothing can separate us from your love, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, be close to all those who are ill with this virus. May they feel the power and comfort of your healing presence, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, for doctors, nurses, and all caregivers, we pray your protection over them from this virus. For those working to develop ways to contain and find medicine to prevent this virus, we ask your guidance, we pray, 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in authority, including our president, who are leading our nation and shaping policies in this essential time of need, that they make wise decisions for the well being of all people, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In times of uncertainty, fear, and stress, may we remember, Lord, that you are the God of love, hope, and faith, and you will never leave us or forsake us. We bring to you those who are dear to us and need, and are in need in body, mind, or spirit. For Ethan, Douglas, Gwen, Linda, Jack, Cole, Laura, Jan, and Craig. Who is on your heart? May they feel the power of your healing presence, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember those we love who have gone on before us to the life beyond. Who is on your heart? May they be in peace with you, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, be with us in each step of our Lenten journey to be mindful always of the wideness of your mercy and loving grace. Please accept these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join in the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Now it's time for announcements. And um, just once again, thanks to everybody for helping make this service possible. Um, I want to let you know we have a few other wonderful Zoom activities coming up this week, um, today at noon. We'll be continuing our Pilgrimage Through Holy Week series. Um, the Zoom link for that is in your e-news that came out yesterday morning and the previous uh, one from Thursday as well. And that'll be, um, this week we'll be talking about Good Friday. What's so good about Good Friday, um, particularly uh, in this moment. So we'll be talking about the tradition and the liturgy of Good Friday. Uh, Reverend Harry Allegri will be joining us from Sonoma as well as uh, Reverend Wendy, myself, uh, Dr. Susan Cockin and Edie Couch. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that at noon. Um, on Thursday at 11 o'clock, um, we'll be having a discussion with um, Dr. Susan Shea, who will be sharing with us about uh, Julian of Norwich, which is her specialty, the medieval mystic who lived through the Great Plague and was in fact an anchorite. She lived her whole life, um, not her whole life, but her uh, adult life, uh, most of it in a in a closed cell. I, I included her in my sermon last week. So a lot of wonderful lessons for us from Julian for this moment. Julian is the one who, um, after her own illness and her mystic visions, said, all shall be well. 
and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So we're really excited to join with, um, with Susan Shea and, and learning more about uh, Julian's message for this time. I um, also want to encourage everybody to, um, uh, if you're a leader of a small group or just have people that you'd like to stay in touch with, to uh, get a hold of Joanna Normoyle, uh, who's our, our new Zoom master, and she'll be uh, helping us uh, get these different groups online so you can continue to meet. Um, if Zoom technology seems a little too, uh, too much for for your particular group, we have a really simple conference call number where you, you don't even have to dial a code, you just dial one number and you're on the line with, with all, all those people that you want to connect with. So we're hoping that um, as many of our groups as possible and maybe even new groups can start to connect this way. Um, also, in, speaking of connecting, I love what, what Fred said about the, our, our need to give back and be part of community. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that right now, um, either from your home so if you're interested in, in, in joining our, our intercessor prayer team, um, if you're interested in, if you're able to get out and are interested in helping with um, needs that people may have for grocery or prescription delivery. Um, and if, you, um, if you're if you interested in being a, a one of the people who's gonna start calling folks and just seeing how they're doing and what needs they may have, um, please shoot me an email. Um, and we're, we're getting these groups organized this week. So look forward to being part of that with all of you. And I'm gonna hand it back to Miles, who's gonna give us instructions on how to participate in Zoom coffee hour. And I'm gonna move up from this location to my couch to do that. So I'll sign off here and I'll see you guys in coffee hour. Blessings. Hi everybody. All right, for anyone who's interested in sticking around for coffee hour, just uh, stay in the meeting. And in a couple minutes, I'll start uh, changing all your status to, um, to allow you to, to start to speak. And um, uh, moving forward, that should be something I mean, that's pretty easy. R just a reminder that once I do change you from attendee to panelist, you'll see a little notification that that's happened. Um, and then if you want to speak, um, or be seen, you'll need to, to turn on the, uh, you'll need to turn off the mute and the stop video, uh, both of which are located in the bottom left of your screen, um, or at least of the, of the Zoom window. Coming up. <laughs> yeah, so I will, uh, I'll start bumping people over. If you need to leave, just feel free, of course, to, to leave, um, just like any other time we're doing coffee hour. Um, I'm doing my best to sort of hit the spirit of that. This is Minerva. She's the least exciting of the small things in our house at the moment, but uh, hopefully I say I will make it out in a little bit too. See you all there in a second. That's his workout room. Sorry. What's that? No, I'm going to go, but I want to see a little bit of what's going to come happen. <laughs> what did you think? Well, I, I, I'm still connected, so. Oh, you're connecting in coffee hour? I just want to see what's going Who are you going to say hi to? Nobody. I just want to see what's all about. Ah, because Judith is on. Oh, really? And Sue is on. Oh, she did get on. Yeah. I tried to say hello to her on um, on the chat feature, but I don't know if she got it. Hey, Fred, we can hear your conversation. We can't do that. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi. Does anybody was... actually have coffee? <laughs> I just finished a cup. Hi. Hi, Lex. Hi, Carlin. That was, Hi. That was a wonderful service. You did a great job. Yeah, everybody was fantastic. Really, really. And the technology worked to perfection. 
Oh my gosh, I, I want to cry. I'm so happy to see your faces. <laughs> well, it's nice to see yours. Hi, Alex. Alex. Hi. We're eating breakfast and listening to great words. <laughs> yeah, what better thing to do? That's great. We miss all of you. It's so good to see everyone. Strange times. Strange, strange times. Lex, I've got to ask you my perennial question. Are you reading anything good now that you're home? Yeah, I am. I've been reading like crazy. Uh, I just um, uh, polished off a book that I really loved. And Carla read it, and she loved it as well. It's called The City of Thieves, written by, written by a guy named David Benioff, who created the Game of Thrones. He's a pretty creative guy. And so that's the novel that I would recommend. And now I'm now I'm reading a book by uh, 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 Larson. What's, uh, what's his first name? Eric Larson, who's a great writer. He wrote a series of books like Dead Wake about the sinking of the Lusitania and In the Garden of the Beasts about uh, Hitler's Germany in the 30s and so on. But this one's called The, the Splendid and the Vile. And it's about um, the first year of the uh, Battle of Britain in, in uh, England and told sort of through and around Churchill and his family. It's a, it's kind of a Luella Parsons piece. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's full of history, but it's also just a great read. It just, just came out. So those are two I can think of off the top of my head that'll keep awesome. it. Awesome. I just great got Hillary Mantel's latest book. Pardon me? I just got Hillary Mantel's latest book that- Yeah, I, I bought that one too. I know it'll be dark. I'm not sure I want to plunge into a dark uh, book in, during these dark times, but you're probably braver than I am. So you- Well, it was free on Audible, so I couldn't resist. Well, I read the first, I read the first three or four pages of it, uh, and uh, it, it's, you know, uh, it's, I, I didn't like her first book the way, the way it was written, and the second and now the third books are really, I really like the way she writes. I mean, it's a very, uh, it's very absorbing writing. So, uh, 